both, and I think that's something that's um, just worth sort of thinking about. And as Jamie touched on, and Craig as well, about what, what do ideas actually mean? And for me, it's very sort of all encompassing. I've tried to mix up some quite different sorts of projects, some of which are sort of self initiated, some of which are commercial ones, um, but to try and sort of explain what I think. I think all the projects we do have ideas in, but I think ideas, again, as somebody mentioned this morning, Jamie, we're great, but it's not just about smiling and which I think is an amazing book. I've got lots of work in it and all sorts of things, but I think it, it feels a bit sort of like a faction, I think it's either that or something else, and I think it's all sorts of things. So, so I'm going to talk about these sorts of things. There's ampersands everywhere. Um, it's all got a bit of fucking man, I'm saying what it's about. Um, but it's a very quick sort of uh, summary of where I started, started at Norwich, um, went to work at Partners, uh, then worked for a small company at HGV, then I co-founded Hattrick Design back in 2001, and uh, had a really good time, really enjoyed it, we did lots of really lovely work, and really sort of took off, uh, but I just somehow lost the joy of, of, of working, and so I had this sort of plan to, uh, I thought perhaps I just need a bit of time off, have a sabbatical, and then I thought maybe I'll have a sabbatical and not go back, and I realised that's leaving. So I left my own company, which is a strange thing to do. Uh, uh, and then I did have like a few weeks off. Then I started to turn the lounge into my sort of studio and it started to work. So um, that's what I've been doing since, since 2014. So. Another bit, a little bit of background of how I got into doing this is um, I had a strange combination at school of, of being good at maths and art. And um, this is my maths neat book, which I found recently. Which isn't very neat, which I quite like. Um, and this is a really amazing painting I did when I was about 10. Um, I realised perhaps I wasn't very good at art when I thought I was. But I, when I was at school, they, um, uh, when I did my own levels and things, which shows how old my levels was, uh, I did really well in and really unexpectedly. So when I came into the sixth form to do my A levels, uh, basically the head teacher brought me into the office and said, You don't have to do art there, you can do some proper subjects. And uh, I just remember thinking, it was that sort of school. Uh, thinking, I don't want to do that, I want to do art. So I ended up doing um, maths and physics and art as a sort of combination. So, um, I worked from home for quite a long time when I set up uh, after the Patrick. Then I bought a little space around the corner. Um, I made a model. You'll see in here about working processes. Uh, I really like making crap models of things. I find it really like, sort of getting your hands moving. And, it sort of engages your brain. So this is a model I made in the studio. This is, um, there's two of them basically. This is me and Ethan. Uh, this is my wife, who's a cow. And these are my two children. So, um, Peggy always seems to be a cow, but a bit sad about that. But she's obviously working out. So. Uh, it's got lots of, um, uh, lots of books and stuff in it. I find books really inspiring. Design a lot of books. So this is the sort of library bit of it. So it's sort of, studio space for showing work. And then uh, this, which I think perhaps, perhaps is the key part of the studio, talk about how to come up with ideas and processes. And we have this wall, which did look like this, but it's absolutely sort of made out now, but where we just stick up every project. And then again, I think it's, it's interesting, the overlap of somebody talked about, Jamie talked about doing lots of projects at the same time, very much the same, just sticking things up, I think are interesting. Uh, and I like the fact that, you know, this is a, background of all we're working on, this is a project we're doing in, in um, LA. It's just all sorts of things. I love the fact they all sort of merge into and all sort of spill over into each other. Uh, and I think it's just a way if you come in in the morning and you see something in the wall and you just get inspired really, really quickly. I was saying to, the, to Craig last night, you know, for me it's, I end up, I do work a lot, I really love work. I have the opposite attitude to Craig about it being a pain and that you were the phrase you used about being I fucking love doing this. So I go in here a lot and I realise now that I just tell myself it's like my shed. So I just go in my shed and potter about. Uh, and it's just not really work. So these are some of the projects I've done over the years, things like the Natural History Museum, a lot of work for Royal Mail, as Jamie mentioned. Um, well, we've started at Hattrick but since then as well. Prostate Cancer, Pallet House, we've got work with William and Starlight. Um, and this is um, a recent project list which perhaps uh, that's not even recent it's um, but this again so there's two of us me and Ethan uh, he's been with us for about six months I think now um, we left college about 
2020, so three years ago. But at any one point, we probably have about 20 or 30 projects on. It's madness, uh, but I really like it. Some of it's really uh, simple, small projects. Some of it's self-initiated. Some of it's huge projects. Um, but I like that. I like that mix. Exactly as Jamie was saying this morning. Um, the um, back of the project list has sort of personal projects that I want to do, like the R and D projects to make them sound more serious. But uh, which I just give names to. I don't know when these are all going to happen. I'm never going to get them all done. But I like the idea of like, there's this idea of doing a kids' pasta book with spaghetti octopuses. And, uh, I like that thought. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But I, hope I write them down. There's just more chance of it happening in the future. And then I saw this one I posted the other day. This is my future collaborators list, which Craig's on. Never going to happen. Um, <laughs> So, as a sort of principle of what I think design is, and I suppose ideas is in the same sort of form, that it can inform and communicate, engage and work, do all those sorts of things. But for me, I think the difference that, or the thing I want to do is I want it to entertain, delight, charm, surprise. And I think that for me is what um, design, and I'd say ideas in the same way, can do. Um, and I suppose the other principle I have is putting joy into work. And my sense is, it's very selfish in some ways. It means I'm having a really nice time doing the work. But I feel like you go sort of this meandering journey. Perhaps this touches on Craig's point about you know, projects can be really hard work. But I don't I think it's, um, I think if you put joy in at one end, you get joy out of the other yourself. But so do your audience. And that's the bit I, I love. That you get that little buzz when you think of stuff. Uh, but then hopefully that gets transmitted to the person at the other end, whether it's the client you're working with. Their, their sort of audience. So. Oh look, there's another client. Oh, what's that there? <laughs> this is an updated one. Uh, perhaps Craig's been deleting it. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to put this one up here. This is a little side project I'm doing about family alphabets, which I'm doing with Christian, who's the guy who's supposed to be speaking this morning. So, um, and you can't read this, it's somebody's got it. So it's Craig, he's still on it, but there he is. <laughs> Um, another thing to talk about for me is about uh, notebooks and noting things. It's definitely the way I work. I carry a notebook around with me all the time. It's, again, reiterates something that Jamie mentioned. It's, you don't think of ideas when you're sitting at your desk and stuff. It's always in the pub or on the train or wherever it might be. Um, so notebooks have become a bit of a sort of an obsession, really. So I went through a phase of just trying loads of different ones, paying huge amounts of money to people like Moleskine. Um, trying to find a sort of perfect one for me, the way I wanted to sort of work. So in the end, I've designed my own now, which aren't for sale. I've made uh, 250, which I think will get me to when I die. It's not bad. Um, <laughs> but I'll get through about one a month, about a bit more of it. Um, but I don't know, I designed this notebook. I got it made with all sort of recycled paper and upcycled materials that the printer had. So it was all sorts of random colours and things like that. Uh, and it's got a very simple floor for the slot in front for hold a pen, it's the size I really like working with. Um, and, and the other thing I realised is sometimes I like line paper and sometimes I like blank. So I just decided to do half and half. Um, and what's interesting about doing this is it, it's sort of it's cheaper than me buying I had to lay out a few grand to get them made. But I worked out, you know, every one I was buying from Moleskine was like 15 quid. So it was actually really worth doing. Um, and they're full of things like this. So sometimes I do crap drawings. My drawings come on since I was 10. Um, other times I'm just scribbling sort of alphabet projects or whatever it might be. There's lots of lists of things. There's things about waking up at four in the morning. They're not for anybody else. They're just for me. Um, so they're not really sort of public consumption. There's just all sorts of shit for people. You know, there's this whole obsession about sounds gets all a bit carried away and things. Um, but for me, it's definitely the way to work is that as I'm drawing, as I have a pen in my hand, my brain starts to sort of click into gear. And then again, you sit on the pen tomorrow, I'll be looking through this and flicking through it, and certain ideas resurface. And so it's just, to me, it's just an essential way of working. I, I think it's worth saying, you know, the, the madness that goes on in my head isn't for everybody. So it's, this is just the way I do stuff. Um, you need to find your own sort of thing. I'll show this project later, but this was again, this sort of constant iteration of playing shapes and forms, and then eventually the idea sort of appears. Um, 
this was a crow I made out of uh, a blackboard I made out of black tape. Um, there's, there's no purpose to this, but it's just really good fun, and I think it's um, again it is, it is. I'm not sort of crazy entirely saying this, but I just I just love making things and doing stuff. For me, it brings me joy. It's the opposite of it grinding me down. The other thing I just wanted to touch on was just observing things. It's that thing of wandering around in the streets and just taking photographs of things like you know, look signs that have been covered up. Uh, that one I really love. Uh, this was a man I found on a bridge. It's just amazing. It looks like some sort of um, blotsy sculpture. Um, this is a series of pictures I'm taking in galleries of gallery attendants and people. This was, we're doing a project at Henry Moore at the uh, Henry Moore Institute. So I was going around the tape, just taking pictures of people with the sculptures. This was a lovely one when I was at the Sainsbury Centre, and again, coming back to what Jamie talked about, um, about feeding stuff in, I love going to galleries and museums and exhibitions and watching films, all sorts of stuff. So I was wandering around the Sainsbury Centre looking at this really lovely Elizabeth Frank sculpture. And this woman's dipping down to get her back, you know. And this stuff is all there. And not that I'm a, a depressive, but these things really cheer me up. That you know, I get a little bit of buzz, you know, when you see stuff, you take a picture of it. Yeah. This was at the uh, Prada Museum in um, Milan last year on a exhibit film, which I just loved because it's just people who just take pictures of themselves. And um, in this sort of mirrored building. These two old ladies at Southwold started to take pictures of sculptures. I really love this because the sort of pomposity of the people get a seagull coming on and shitting on top of their heads. Um, and, and these are all unique photographs, loads of people take photographs like this, but to me it just keeps your brain engaged, just looking around and seeing stuff. And to say it just it just keeps um, feeding you in some sort of way. So I was looking at this was in Bedford Square and I was waiting for these pigeons to do something a bit more interesting and just sit there and one of them flew down. And I didn't even know I'd taken this picture until later on. And I was thinking, because I must have just sort of glimpsed. I love the way that this pigeon's now become part of this sculpture. This would be an amazing sculpture if you made it look like that. This is forever hairdressing <laughs> <laughs> um, Obviously not. Uh, this is beautiful nails, which I really love. I love the fact that the shutters only open up to here, so you can sort of crawl into the shop. <laughs> This is angel's nail. Nail bars seem to obviously have a problem in time. So look at that, it's just brilliant. I love the fact that there's a nail missing here, which is why this is happening. You know, how can you can't make these things happen? So. And then I'm going to show seven projects. I'm doing well. Um, the first one I wanted to show, and this is really about process as much as the project itself. There's an amazing designer called Richard Baird who publishes this thing called Logo Archive. Uh, it's all online and stuff like that. He does these little zines. Uh, and it's all sort of modernist logo type. Really lovely guy, very uh, intense, very serious. And I met him at one of the launches, and I said I'd really like to do one with him, because he sometimes does it with um, collaborators. When we settled on this idea, doing it, the idea about doing it about play, but they're really beautifully done, really simply done. He sort of scans them into old books and digitizes them. So he does some with other designers, and just a really lovely resource, but not expensive, but really sort of beautifully produced. And, um, so we started to look in about, he wanted to have some sort of, um, I suppose, <coughs> academic approach to it, what, pl what the play actually about. And I think it's, uh, so we started to look up all of these sorts of words, which for me was a lovely way of learning a bit about what play is. I read lots of academic books about play written by various people. Um, and then about work, so this idea of how you put the two things, which is obviously what I'm trying to talk about. And um, found loads of really lovely quotes, and I, and I really sort of keep reiterating this idea that for me, play and joy is not a sort of uh, a nice to have. It's like a central part of the way I sort of want to live and want to work. Um, and so I put this in because, and not to keep picking on the crate, but people like Jack Rennie, for example, talk about sort of blood, sweat, and tears, and how you have to sort of give over all of this some energy. To I think it's nonsense. We're just designers. It's not. It's not sort of. Um, it's not hard work, is it? It's fun. So this truffle pig. I love this idea of truffle pigs. That they just root them out. And I don't know whether they are having a good time, but they look like they are, and they're just searching for that sort of treasure. 
And I think that's the way I think about projects. They come in, it's not like, oh shit, what are we going to do? It's like, let's just have a really lovely time looking for stuff and finding it. So, when we started to work, uh, Richard and I on this, on this scene, same thing, just making crap little models, how it might fold up. Could it be quite interactive? This thought that, you know, maybe we could split the logos up and, um, you know, you reform them and you actually start to play with the, the magazine itself. So this was some early mock-ups of that. Um, and then he came in with all of these amazing archive logo books from the 60s and 50s and 60s and stuff. And we just started mucking about. And the process of it was wonderful. Even if this had never come out, I really enjoyed the time working with it. And so we came up with this thought of um, uh, maybe you could, because they're all modernist logo types and all very sort of geometric, perhaps we could split them up and you almost a bit like that sort of pairs game, and try and put them back together again. And um, I didn't think he'd do this, and you could see he was feeling nervous about sort of fucking around with other people's logo types. But actually, once we talked about it, and the fact you could then reform them, uh, it was fine, so it was really good. So, and they just fit together really beautifully. Uh, and obviously we scaled them so it sort of semi-worked um, when you put them together. And they start to almost look like they were like that in the first place. It really makes you study the logos almost more than if you got them in the right way. Um, and so the other thing that was nice is we could use the logo archive logo within the little play. We started to do things like this. This didn't even make it into the zine, but it was just a you know a few hours just moving time around and having fun with it. Um, this is again the sort of notebook thing, so just me scribbling stuff and this was a tiny little A8 book, I think. These sort of mad scribbles of just you know, playing with letters and forms. And it's almost a type of therapy for a lunatic. Um, uh, so this was part of the thing that was in the guide. And then but the reason I wanted one of these I want to show this is that he was really keen, as I said, that there was some sort of uh, almost academic essay in here about play. So. Um, and I was thinking, well, I, I won't be able to really write that. I mean, I'm very different from Craig. I'm rubbish at writing. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe we could do it with Tom Sharp, who's a poet, who did a lot of work with. I'm going to show some of his projects in a bit. But um, one of the things I read in this book, uh, written by this American uh, professor, was about uh, the sea squirt, uh, the fate of the sea squirt. This was one of the chapters. And this is this amazing, I think, sort of parable. Uh, which for me really applies, as I said, to the way, the way I work, the way I think as a designer is you can look at the world and can you feed in effectively. And the sea squirts basically are, um, to sort of paraphrase a simple way of saying it, are um, they live on the seafloor, they wander around and sort of look for food uh, and sort of investigate and try and find somewhere and they, they find a bit more food and they wander somewhere else. And at some point in their life they get quite comfortable and they attach themselves to a rock and wait for food to float past. And um, what happens is eventually not enough food starts to float past. But by that point, all of their muscles or whatever they've got become uh, atrophied. atrophied. Uh, and they start to um, effectively sort of decompose. If you look up the sea squirt, the thing that comes out is the fact that they start to eat their own brain. And as they do that, they get more and more uh, unable to move around and do anything. And I think it's a lovely parable that Stuart Brown talks about, that it's the same for humans, that you've got to keep investigating, looking around, going somewhere unexpected, exploring, and that's what keeps you fed. And that if you just stay in one place, then you just start to eat your own brain. That's not technically true. <laughs> so, so then I spoke to Tom and said, told him this story, and said, could he just write some sort of... Uh, piece about it, whatever it might be, to put in the, in the magazine. So he sent this back, and I remember when it turned up thinking there's no way Richard's going to let us sort of do this. But Tom wrote it in such a brilliant way that it starts off with all of this made up language, like really delicious, gem fruity, bubble eyed, stars find deep sea, you can make it up, ocean oddities. And as you read through uh, the story, it basically gets straighter and straighter and more and more boring. It starts like this, and at the end, it ends with this point about buccal tentacles, uh, and in the atrium there are no sense organs. 
So it's just a lovely way of, uh, in writing, doing exactly the same idea that it just gets duller and duller as you go through. So. Then it gave us an opportunity to design a little logo for the C squirt, so more sort of scribbles, started to do lots of variations, things like that. And then, so this became a little booklet uh, within the booklet about how the silly C squirt was to explain. Uh, this was the cover. Lovely uh, Shigeo Kakuda logo type which chopped up into bits. And so basically it comes, it's all mixed up. The nice thing about this uh, commercially is that you have to buy two copies because it's all tail up and you have to keep it on yourself. So. Um, but it just became this really interesting collection of things. And so these almost look like the original logo types and stuff like so. And it's a lovely, lovely in a, for me, a really interesting sort of way about how tearing up books because it's all perforated. Uh, it's a really odd thing to do, like it turns up you just really don't want to destroy that book. But you almost destroy it and then rebuild it back again. So um, it became a sort of, and then you tear it into these little sort of strips, so that's the little booklet. Um, and these are the games you can play with it. Things. So it turned something that was very serious and sort of sensible into something much more playful. And, uh, but then you could just start to make these things. We'd had a little like, launch exhibition for it uh, called Play. Um, we made big cardboard versions of these. This again was lovely on the Saturday. There were loads of kids came around. It was a place near Bermondsey Street. Uh, and just started to muck about these local types. And it just looks really lovely that people started to make. You know. And then I found this. This was in uh, Margate on the beach uh, whilst we were working on this project. And again, for me, that's not a coincidence that we find uh, you know, this washed up C square. Uh, game six. This is um, a very strange project that I did with Tom. Um, so I've just told somebody in the pub earlier that, that I've got this other obsession about chess, uh, the sort of graphics of it. I play chess, I'm completely rubbish at it, but I really like playing it. I really, there's something about getting lost uh, whilst you're playing. But I also really love the graphic language, the numbers of squares, and it sort of comes, it comes back to that sort of mathematical brain, I suppose. So this was a chess set I did a few years ago using um, the characters. Uh, this was another chess set I made that was cut out on a piece of cardboard. So well, these are your two castles, and, sorry, two, uh, king and queen, and this is your um, castles and these. Um, so we did that. Uh, and again, so I, I I have that sort of obsession, a bit like the ampersand thing, and then I think what that does um, is that then somebody who's like Tom doing a project, which turned out to be this project, sort of thinks he wants to design it to work on it, and thinks, well, I know Jim to play chess, so maybe I'll ask him. So it's that thing about doing stuff that's out of your, uh, as, as we talked about earlier, not what you normally do, I think it starts to attract you to other people, and then you start to get really interested to commissions or collaborations or so this was a project that Tom had come up with, which was all about a really famous chess game um, called Game 6, played in 1972, that was between uh, Bobby Fischer and Spassky. And it was very much a sort of parable about Cold War. And this was at a point in 1972 where Cold War was at its height. Chess was almost this way of um, the two sort of superpowers sort of fighting in some way, but on a, on a chess board. So a very famous sort of game. And uh, he said basically what he's going to do, he's a writer and a poet, he was going to write a poem for each of the moves. And he just wanted us to do something with it, to do a book or an exhibition or, a, or an event. So we started to look up all the visual references for this. And again, it comes back very much to what Craig was talking about. Just you suddenly get into all these sort of cultural references. You, a lot of it was about uh, you know, Trump and Putin now. It was about Iceland, about where it had gone on. It's about the Bhagavad Gita, which is this classic Indian poem that Tom had read, and he wanted to weave that in. It, interestingly, this was before the um, Ukrainian war, uh, but there was quite a lot about Ukraine in it, because it was when the Crimea had just happened and stuff like that. So we just started to dig out all of these sorts of cultural references. And then the first thing I wanted to do, which was shown in that um, little sketchbook earlier, is just do a little logo for game six. I like the idea of doing it with squares. And then I really like the idea of perhaps we could do 64 different logo types that were all skewed and uh, black and white, so that's what we did. And we don't need 64 logo types. 
but this was just really good fun to do. We used them in various places. But it was just a lovely way of just playing for like an hour, uh, of just moving these around. And I, it's the sort of thing I, I so mentally just does me a lot of good. I just think someone's just, it's just playing and just experimenting and trying stuff. And then we thought, well, it would be nice to have, uh, because I've done lots of chess projects before, they've always been black and white, and we dug out all these references and saw all this colour. It would be lovely to do 64 colours for the project. So Tom named all of these in the end. But things like this is um, Trump's town. This was um, like a bishop's robe. I know that this was, I think this might have been um, UKIP colours for their logotype. No, these are the UKIP colours here. But what was lovely about it, we did this quite randomly, which is Rosie and I was working with at the time. But it just created this lovely coloured um, board where all the colours had, so coming back to the point about what an idea is, the, all of these colours have got an idea in some form. They come from the references we found. But it just created something decoratively beautiful, I think. Um, so yeah, this is when Tom named all these colours. Uh, then we did a book. Uh, we really liked the idea of doing it. We did the su we did it the size of um, Bobby Fisher's uh, practice board that he used, so it's like a little sort of almost a four square book. We liked the idea of using the portraits, and we thought maybe it'd be really nice to mix them up. And the book, uh, the the story of Bobby Fisher is really interesting because he basically goes mad from playing chess. And so this idea of madness, and but just by mixing up the two portraits, you end up with this really weird sort of chimera. Um, so this is what we did, we used the colours from the Soviet flag and the American flags, so this was the, um, one of the colours to the book. And then we thought, well actually we'll do eight colours, so everything was to do with either 8 or 64 or, or 32, with other characters that Tom had weaved in. Uh, and then we produced this little book which used all the 64 colours, so each move was then with the, the poem that he'd written. Um, you could play chess on the book itself. These were the eight covers we did. I mean, look at this. This is fucking unbelievable. This is uh, Trump and Putin. And it just creates this absolutely grotesque portrait of the two of them. And it didn't really take very long. And we just used the grid that we had. And this one was based on the way the castle moves, so it's straight. One of them's based on the way the horses move, so it's got that sort of dog leg. Um, and we so we produced these different eight covers. Uh, we did barcodes on the back to try to show there's a link to the film that we did. Um, and then it turned into this, that book was being produced. We thought it would be really nice to have some sort of event or produce something digitally. And, and all of this is unpaid. It was all just, let's just do it as a collaboration together. So we started to talk about some of the other characters uh, that, that he'd featured. There was things about O.J. Simpson, there were things about uh, Hunter Thompson. There were, you know, uh, Trump, Putin, Boris Johnson, all these people that he referenced. And so we had this thought again, not knowing how we would do this, of... Um, Rook to C1. So Are you analyzing the game? Or has your attention wandered? That can happen in ambient wars of attrition and in art. So we had this thought that... Um, we can do them as deep plates. We found this guy Mario, who's this amazing uh, sort of tech geek, and that was him there just reading that one of the poems out and then putting it with Marina and Bramovic. Eleven, Rook to C1. And then the Are you analysing the game? Or has your attention wandered? That can happen in ambient wars of attrition and in art. Fifteen, Pawn takes C5. Who is Spassky, winter mute of the workers? Anti-Western wit, wrong-sided weapon, the weight of Orwell's windmills waiting to wound. 18, knight to d4, 20, pawn to e4, 30, pawn to h4, 33, pawn to a4, 37, Queen to E4, rotates F6. So we suddenly found ourselves in this world of, you know, I don't know if this is graphic design or, or what it's really, but I don't really care. It was really good fun to do. Working with Mario was brilliant. Tom's writing all these amazing words. So we did that, and then um, 
we decided to hire a space to do a sort of projection version of the film um, that we'd made. So this was a model I made of the space. Uh, this is a pencil uh, scale. Um, and we decided to print the chessboard on the floor so people would walk around and it would come to pieces. And these were going to be these eight projectors. And so we made this and thought, okay, this would be great. We hired some people to help us sort of um, do some projection work. And then walked in one day to this space, which was obviously slightly bigger than we made the model of. So, um, and we based it for a day. We hired the space for a day um, and uh, got there 18 in the morning. And then the event was at sort of seven in the evening. And um, again, completely out of our comfort zone, of having really no idea how any of this was going to work and what it would do. And we obviously spent quite a lot of money hiring things and making and borrowing and stuff from people. Um, but then having these eight projectors that would go through various parts of the home that Tom had written. Yeah, this is a poetry book launch, really. It's sort of madness, the amount of effort and time that went into it. Um, and so this was the event. We convinced two designers we know to play the game um, whilst people arrived. Um, and we didn't know anything about chess, so they just memorised it and then played the game. Uh, but people turned up with no idea what was going to really go on. Um, so they played the game. Then Tom read some of the poetry out. And then we projected um, all of these things on the eight, on the eight things. We had these eight laptops set up uh, doing this. This is David in the uh, And I, I love this sort of, uh, you know, working on identity problem and you know, doing projects like that. Um, this I put in, partly for Christian, although he's now not here, uh, that uh, Christian and I were playing chess quite a lot over lockdown. And um, both of us are really poor at playing chess, but uh, we really like the sort of the game, we're just getting lost and just chatting on playing. And we decided to, to make a chess board uh, between us based on chess notation. So this is where you basically just have these sort of, you know, A to H, 1 to 8. And what's quite interesting about this is we thought, well, while we were playing, it would be really nice if they were just written on the board itself. So we basically designed a really black typeface, which would be these ones. But we just did the minimum we could to make a black square that said B8, for example. And then we did a really thin typeface, so this is B1, it's for the black squares, and then we just combined them together. And what was nice about this, this was sitting in a pub in Preston about a year ago, when we came up to the conference last year. Uh, we had designed the board, we ran a copy of it out, and we sat in the pub all day, getting more and more drunk, uh, playing chess on our chess board, sort of love and just making little notes about actually you need to change that letter or do this. Just a really lovely way of working. Um, we called it notation rotation, because we like the idea you can spin it around, so the black squares are the right way around the black player, and the white squares are the white player. It's really lovely that it's got eight letters in each word, so you can spin it around. Um, again, it doesn't really need a logo, but that's not the point. It's just part of that game of being able to sort of play and do more. Um, we drank Guinness while we did it. This is quite interesting. This is Christian's notebook. Looks like this. <laughs> My notebook looks like that. And so this was the board we had done. And so we made eight of these. We don't know what to do with them. We've got one each to play on, and we've got these six other ones. But I just like the idea of just creating stuff and playing this design of time. And all of this feeds into the commercial projects that we do. So it's, it's a bit like going to sort of like mental gymnastics. It's just playing and exercising your brain. So, so these are the balls that we had shot last week. So it's printed onto a recycled black paper sort of um, substrate, which is really lovely. Uh, just digitally printed in white. It's almost totally illegible, but don't worry. Reconstruction. This is another thing I wanted to talk about. I run workshops with DNAD about play and uh, very sort of tactile about making things. And one of the exercises is to do with uh, flags. And I put this in because this is a, a big commercial project we did in Brazil a few years ago, an arts project, uh, all about identity, uh, portraits of identity. And uh, for the logotype, we had a very simple idea of deconstructing the flag and making this little person. 
um, so it became the symbol for all of these portraits for this art project. And that led us to the idea of doing this as a workshop idea, sort of idea. And again, I love the, um, almost the political aspect of this. The flags being used often in amazing ways like this in the, in the 2012 Olympics. But the same flag can then be used for the you know, British National Party and all these sorts of people. And I, I love the idea of taking something that's very straight and quite po-faced, often very nationalistic, and just playing with it. And um, you know, the same way that you get something like this happening, and then in the same period of time, this one. So basically, it's a very simple exercise, um, which you can do at home, uh, of taking flags and cutting them up and making them into other things. And it's the, again, the, coming back to the point about coming up with ideas and how do you come up with ideas, this thing for me about giving yourself the restrictions, that you can only use these shapes, and then what can you make out of that? So you can't, you can't waste any of the shapes, you can't change any of the shapes, you've got to somehow just cut out the ones that are there and try and make something quite magical out of something that's very restrictive. Alice made this one. This is unbelievable. Look at this. This is that. So this is the Macedonian Yoga Society that I've decided. This is a ninja turtle. <laughs> Uh, and so we made this into a book, which we self-published um, the year before last, I think. It's called National Reconstruction, and it's just full of these, basically. And then in some of the workshops I've done with the Typographic Circle, we make you know, a whole alphabet out of flag shapes, so that, that was some of the book as well. This was a whole thing of sort of uh, solar system. This is like a, just from a flag of guitar to a little rocket. And so that became this book, this sort of floppy book. Then I worked with Nick Asprey, um, who spoke earlier in the week. We decided to do the same with words. So this is all uh, country names as anagrams. So this is Iran and Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sri Lanka. I don't know Sri Lanka. I quite like the fact that we've done alphabetically that uh, you get pains and then only this And the only clue that was given was the fact that the capital letters fitted with the country names. This one I love, Nick wrote. This is the um, United States of America. <laughs> just when all that Trump stuff was going on, I just thought it was fucking amazing. So. Also in the book, coming back to that thing about observation at the front, I started to photograph lots of road markings that look like flags. This is the flag of Kennington. This is family. That was in the back of the book as well. So this book became a bit of a sort of collection of anything flag related. So projects would use flags in the exercise of national reconstruction, but also the um, anagrams plus photographs plus anything else really was completed. And in the back was this photograph that I'd taken at Cam Sands. This was about two weeks after the Brexit vote. Uh, and I just wandered past this flag that, that um, just, was just lovely. What that led to was a workshop I did last year with um, HP, and they, um, and, and I don't know what this project is really, but they asked us to do a workshop through DNAD, uh, and I wanted to do the flag one, and it was all about using variable data printing, which a lot of people are starting to do now, which is like a sort of coding, so that you feed certain things in, and it prints, or, or generates lots of sort of um, iterative, sort of loading types and things like that. So we did a thing based on flags, and because um, the Ukrainian war thing was still going on, we decided to use their flag. Worked with a programmer called Oswin, amazing sort of guy, and um, we basically just wanted to, in the workshop, generate uh, shapes and flags from these existing seed files. And um, what was amazing is once he got up and running, he basically generated something like 5,000 on the minute. Uh, we'd artworked the covers of those books individually as little bits of flags, and this machine just generated all these really lovely bits of those flags in all in random fashion. Basically, it's, it's a sort of exercise in infinity, basically. We'll just carry on producing these things. And I think they're just really lovely, sort of abstract pieces of something. And um, it, it's again a, that doing that logotype of Thomas Brazil led us to the workshop idea, which led us to doing the book, which now led us to this HP project. So I love this idea that these things sort of just cascade. Um, and I don't know what we're going to do with these, but I just really love them. They're not things we would have generated ourselves. 
they're not the colours we would have done. It doesn't colour our land and sort of generate a lot. I just think they're really beautiful. And then the last of projects. Um, this is a commercial project we did last year called London Fire Brigade with Tom. Uh, and they asked us basically to design a new part of the project, to design a new type base for it. And um, we did a lot of research, uh, basically for them to use for their headlines, but also for the museum that's going to reopen quite soon, and also to raise money through uh, products and merchandise. Things like that. So we did a lot of research about this sort of you know, amazing lettering that we can get uh, on old fire engines. And we love this idea because they're from a certain period of time. They all use this sort of shadow type. We love the thought that um, the research of that, but combined with the idea of light and shadow. So the idea of getting near a flame and the shadow being cast. So it led us to this typeface, uh, which we worked with family types on. Um, that just became a really simple sort of thought. It just feels fire energy, sort of straight away. So it's been a really lovely um, project to work on. Uh, we wanted to include their little badge that they have, this little shape. So we had a whole set of alternate lids that used like exclamation marks and full stops, things like that. Uh, we did a flame as part of the typeface. We did the hashtag, which of course was a rosy idea, which I thought was wonderful. Designed so like a ladder. Uh, we did a whole series of arrows, obviously with that. So we started to do a bit of an experiment with the idea of sort of flickering flames and shadows. <coughs> we're still working on at the moment. Um, and then Tom wrote this, I think, st stunning uh, piece of uh, writing um, about uh, the idea that they run towards when everyone else is running away. And um, this was, again, really interesting for me politically. It was a time when all Grenfell thing had come out and the fire brigade were getting completely slammed in the press. And I just remember thinking they obviously had failures at the time, but it wasn't the and the women. It was either their sort of bosses or it was all the people that made the cladding badly and all that sort of stuff. So Tom wrote this thing about, um, about them being the heroes uh, and the fact they're running towards us so when everyone else is running away. And Tom's just a brilliant writer and it's that thing of, as perhaps as Craig touched on earlier, it's that thing of working with people that just really push you and do stuff to me that I can't do. So you kind of find somebody that's just really good at it and just do lots of projects with them. That's what I'm trying to do. So we came up with this phrase. We then took over a fire station as part of the London Design Festival last year uh, and printed this as a big banner at the top. And what's so lovely about this is we got permission obviously from the fire service to do this, is that it's still up. Um, and you just see it. Sure, it's just on um, Old Street Rambler. And then for the launch, we printed his poem huge on the side of the wall and on the floor. Uh, these were pictures we took a couple of weeks ago because uh, it's still there, and the fire so the people there are just absolutely love it. And um, so it's basically in this sort of phase where the fire engines come. To, when we were there, one of the firemen came out and said, uh, Are you from the States? Because we want to try and redo some of our signage and things. And the guy we were working for said, Oh, no, you have to go and fill in this form, you have to do this and do that. We're not allowed to touch the, you know, the outside. And so um, we then found out that they really wanted to have the number of the fire station on the outside. So we just got this made whilst we were doing the rest of the volumes and just put it up and didn't ask it. And um, it's just a lovely thing. And they were so pleased inside because it was the whole place is pretty shabby. You know, they haven't got any money. Their funding's been cut. And like that. Uh, it just gave them a sort of sense of pride. And I think um, that's sort of what that project was about, really, with Tom Wright, about let's get away from this sort of uh, politics of it all and actually celebrate what they do you know, as. as and then just to finish, I just wanted to go through the ampersand bit. I was just talking to Andy Cambridge about this, um, because obviously he uses it in his um, email signature. I suppose he did it before me, but I don't agree with that. Um, 
So this was done in 96, I think. When did you start, Andy? Uh, I've been late to that year. <laughs> no, I think the finals was done in 2012. So uh, I did a workshop. Uh, so this is before I left Hatching. I did a letterpress workshop, which I love. And the exercise that I came with is that you just set your name and the date. And I went in there, and, and he said, you're doing what everybody else does, which is go and find the biggest wheat types. That's the most fun to sort of play with. So I did it, and then realized it wouldn't fit on a sheet of paper. So I just thought, well, I put an ampersand in, it will say the two characters. So I set this, really liked it. And then two years later, when I left Hatchery, and I was thinking, well, I'm going to set up a new studio, I'm going to call it after me. Uh, and I just thought, well, I could use this for my logo. And that's what I, that's what I did. So it's lovely the fact I didn't really have to think about it very much. It was just such a simple sort of solution. So. And it's led me recently to, to start just doing ampersands whenever I can. It's just a bit of play. You know. So this is from a book called The Graphic Lexicon about the origins of symbols and uh, uh, words. So this is where an ampersand comes from, it's et in Latin. This is one I found in the street that I walked past. Really nicely, I walked past late at night and it somebody had turned it into this sort of swash cap to draw it up. This one we did for Starbright Shoes. This was a chess one that's based on uh, black and white, these two black and white squares. This was for a talk to the pentagram, all made out of paper clips. This was the idea about joy, trying to work out if you can work like the word joy. This was done for uh, Berlin Design Festival. This one I put in because this was for the San Francisco um, Design Conference. And it had this theme of unity. And I thought it would be really nice to do a, try and do an ampersand out of the letters. So this again is a sort of crap you know, little way of just making it to see if it's going to work. And then, um, there's this. And a lot of these things look quite sort of effortless, which just take fucking ages to try and work out. And, um, but I, 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 it's just playing, it's for me, it's just playing, it's just, this will lead into projects, I don't really care if it's a commercial project or own project, it's just making stuff that I like. Um, this was when I moved out of my studio at home, and I came back in, and then uh, Hetty had done this, and I couldn't believe that my, my daughters or my wife had done this, but it was literally that it fell over as a walked out. And I love the fact, to me, again, this is about this, but I just see Hetty looking at me going, well, fuck off then, if you're moving out. Um, this I saw last week, uh, I was away on holiday, and I just went out to this uh, sort of um, chair outside, and this was there. I just think, how the fuck does that happen? You know, because I, I find with these things, ones I find, you're not allowed to cheat and make them, you actually just find them. So this was just a tiny bit of white cotton, making this really beautiful uh, answer. This was for uh, a film we'd done the titles for about uh, some sort of Norwegian, I should have shown this to a Norwegian film uh, that features like the hedgehogs, so we designed a hedgehog type first. This was one I did for a talk at Norwich, and I was on a plane on the way back from holiday somewhere. And I, I thought, I'd, I'd like the idea of doing a talk, of sort of a list of all the things I was going to talk about. And I got really excited, and I started to try and I tore a bit of paper out of my notebook, thinking, I wonder if this idea would work. And it was just at that point where they announced you have to put all your tables away and things like that. So this is my knee. So the plane is coming down, and my ears are sort of popping, and I'm sitting there trying to make this thing. So I made this little ampersand, uh, and then that led to the poster itself. Uh, this was for a pencil box we did, uh, I did it for Y, uh, where we just used shapes of uh, pencils, like shavings. This was a cover for a Japanese design magazine called Brain. This was for a talk at Hertfordshire. Uh, their symbol was this stag. Uh, I just really liked the different sort of characters that you can get from it. And just to finish really about the opposite of plays and work, it's not about work and play, it's depression. And that's it.